Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm a PhD student at Indiana University. I study English, rhetoric, and composition, and today I'm making a video to talk to you guys about how to decide which grad program is right for you. So I'm filming this in the beginning of March, and I got accepted to my PhD program five years ago. And I remember around late February, early March is when acceptances, rejections, wait lists started rolling in. And I was just like really overwhelmed and really under mentored in how to decide which program is right for you and how to decide which school ultimately to attend. I went by gut feelings. Ultimately, I guess it sort of worked out for me but there were things that I definitely wish I knew before deciding which program to go to and I want to chat with you guys about them today. So I'm breaking this up into three categories, money, fit, and will you get a job at the end? And you can use the sections at the bottom of this video to sort of fast forward or rewind to the sections that are most pertinent to you. So starting with money, if you're going to a PhD program, especially in the humanities, do not go into it if you are not funded. That is my biggest advice unless you are sitting on like a huge pot of gold or something. PhD programs, especially in the humanities, can be very, very expensive. And I say specifically in the humanities because more than likely the job that you get at the end of it will not be enough to pay off all those loans. It's not like you're gonna be a medical doctor, a super specialized surgeon or something where you're making all of this money back. Um, a lot of us are going on to be professors where you're probably making under six figures a year. So having all of those loans, in my opinion, not worth it. Don't apply to a program unless it's fully funded. So in terms of funding, things to look at are how much money they're giving you and if that is a 12 month stipend or if it is a nine month stipend. So speaking from experience here at IU, I'm on a nine month stipend. Um, but summer teaching is not guaranteed. So what a stipend means is they waive my tuition, I pay zero dollars in tuition and fees, and they give me a stipend of upwards of $20,000 a year, just being totally transparent with you guys. And I have to stretch that over the course of 12 months to make it enough to live off of. And that pays for all of the basic necessities, rent, food, anything I do for fun, clothes, all of the above. Summer teaching is optional here, so that number can be increased if I get summer teaching or if I get a summer job or if I have a part-time job. Speaking of part-time jobs, that's also something to look at. Do a lot of students in that program that you're deciding on have part-time jobs? If they do, that probably means that the stipends aren't high enough for the cost of living in the city. So I'm currently living in Indiana, which is the middle of nowhere, but Bloomington, surprisingly, is a really expensive town, especially right here, I think, because it's a college town. Bloomington has just recently in the past year been named the most expensive city to live in in all of Indiana. So it's pretty expensive here. So a lot of us did have part-time jobs. I had a part-time job. I worked at the Writing Center and then I was a social media coordinator almost for the whole time that I've been a grad student until recently. I've decided that I'm gonna cut back on spending and really spend the most of my time writing the dissertation so I can get out of here and get a real job. But that's something totally to consider. Do a lot of students in that program have to have these part-time jobs in order to make ends meet? Or are they taking out loans? And this is something that you can ask when you visit for prospective student weekend, or if they give you the opportunity to just chat with other grad students via email or Zoom appointments. This is something that I would ask other grad students because they will be the most honest and the most transparent with you about if the money is enough to make ends meet. Another thing to think about is if you're competing for funding. So here at IU, I am not competing for funding against the rest of my cohort members. So a cohort is basically like the group of I don't know, in my program, typically like five or six of you that are incoming at the same year and you follow the same trajectory and the same timeline, more or less. But if you're competing for funding against your cohort members, that creates this really competitive environment. If I know programs where there's maybe only like one person who gets a stipend and the other ones have to figure out how to pay for it on their own, to me, that is not the vibe. And I knew that is not a program that I wanted to go to. So all of us are funded, all of us get the same funding. I mean, to my knowledge, um, we're all giving, getting the same amount of money. So that's something to keep in mind too. Is it a competitive program? Are you competing for funding? And if you're okay with that, cool. But if you're like me, not the vibe. Another thing to think about is conference funding. So in my field, conferences are pretty important. I try to go to at least one conference a, a year, ideally two to three perhaps. And in the era of COVID, when everything was on Zoom, this wasn't an issue because you just had to pay conference registration, which is like between 50 and 100 bucks most times. But now that things are meeting in person again, travel to conferences, 
like arrangements for housing when you're there, staying in a hotel, staying in an Airbnb, food, all of that can be really, really expensive. So my program is pretty good on conference funding and that is one of the reasons why I chose to come here. We had a pretty large, large endowment um, to go for like the teaching of writing and conferences and travel related to the teaching of writing. Um, so the last conference that I went to a couple weeks ago, my department totally funded it. They paid for my hotel registration, all the meals, all of that stuff, which was awesome. But I know a lot of other programs aren't like that. So I would consider how many conferences is it typical for people in your field to go to a year? And how many conferences does that department typically fund? There are other ways to get funding for conferences. Um, like I could go to the College of Arts and Sciences rather than just the English department, but those are a lot more competitive. There's external grants, all of that stuff. Sometimes the conference itself will pay for students in need. Um, but these are things to think about. If conferences are important in your field, do you have the money to go to those conferences? Will your department provide that money for you? And again, is it competitive against people in your program or does everyone get funded? Another thing to look at is insurance. So in addition to having a stipend of upwards of 20,000, like I said, I also have insurance, um, basic insurance, vision, dental, health insurance. And this is all great because I am older than 26, so I can no longer be on my parents' insurance anymore. But this would be especially tough if you're going to grad school and you are maybe going back to school, you're a little bit older, or you will be turning older than 26 sometime in your program, which I think is like the vast majority of people going to PhD programs. And if you live in the United States, insurance is really, really important to consider. Um, Cause that could be a huge expense if you have to like pay for that on your own, unless you have like a spouse or someone who's gonna be able to like get that insurance for you. But through IU, I just have to pay like really basic co-pays, pay like 20, 25 bucks every time I go to the health center, every time I see a primary care physician, um, get like two free cleanings a year, all of that good stuff. But insurance is definitely something to consider. And if you are going to grad school and you need to be the insurance provider for if you have children or if you have a spouse or a partner, I would definitely ask about that. That is very, very important. And then the last thing that I would consider about money is to look into the history of the program or to look into the history of grad students in that school and to see how often they are getting raises. So recently, last year, around this time last year, last spring, the grad students at IU, not just in English, across the entire university, went on strike for higher pay and better working conditions. And we ended up getting quite a significant raise. In the English department, we got almost a $5,000 raise. But for other programs, this was even bigger. Some programs went from making $6,000 a year on their stipends all the way up to $18,000, which is huge. So I would definitely do some digging. This is another area that you could speak to maybe like the more seasoned grad students who are in like their fifth or sixth year about how often they are getting raises, if there's strikes, if there's a grad student union who can lobby for raises. These are all wonderful things to keep in mind as you think about, will I have enough money to attend this program? Will they be paying me enough? How do I know which program is right for me? The next category is fit. So fit of interest. Will that program be a good fit for you? Will you be a good fit for that program? I made a huge mistake in applying to grad school and I only applied to really highly ranked schools. So this was typically R1 universities. I use in the Big Ten, applied to schools in the SEC, schools that were in like these national ranking, which is really just like arbitrary lists put together by like boards of Ivy League white men. We don't have to get into all of that. I think ranking systems are really biased coming from someone whose undergrad university is ranked top five every year. There's a lot of history and a lot of studies about how this stuff is problematic, but I won't get into that. So don't look at rank when you're applying, when you're deciding where to go, or don't let that be the determining factor. Don't go to the school that is ranked the highest, go to the school that's gonna be the best fit for you. So what I mean by fit is a few different things. So one big thing in rhetoric and composition programs is programs reputations. So there are a few different programs that I can think of that have like really distinct reputations. Like Clemson is really big on like digital rhetoric and stuff like that. Um, our reputation here at IU is like, an interdisciplinary reputation where like people are allowed to do rhetoric and a bunch of other things. Um, UNC is a lot of political rhetoric and stuff like that. This is really hard to find out what programs reputations are until you're like in the field. I do not know how to advise you um, into going about finding out these reputations. What I would do is perhaps go on websites and read grad student bios and see what they're studying and see if you could pull out themes. A lot of people here at IU also study um, pedagogy. Teaching is a really big interest here. 
So read those bios and see if there's any common themes or if a bunch of people are studying, I don't know, like medieval literature and rhetoric or just medieval literature. That program probably has a really big reputation for that. You can also see how many faculty specialize in that. So here at IU, we have quite a large rhetoric faculty because we have rhetoric and communication and rhetoric and composition. Um, but we only have like one person who really focuses on digital stuff. So digital isn't like the biggest reputation here for IU. So do some digging, try and find that reputation that fits with your specific research interests. Another way that you can find out what this program's reputation is, or if you'll be able to study what you want to study, if you'll be a good fit there, if it'll be a good fit for you, which is just as important, is to look at previous class offerings. So a lot of schools, I would say like every school I think is required to have um, like the course listings for the past three semesters to the past three years and look at how many courses were offered in your specialty. So for me, rhetoric is in the English department, but then I have my specialties within rhetoric, which is more like digital rhetoric, embodied writing, teaching writing, stuff like that. So when I came here, there weren't a lot of classes being offered in those areas, maybe like one class every few semesters on digital rhetoric, but digital rhetoric wasn't my interest when I came here. That's another story. But I know a school like NC State, I think I was looking at, has a bunch of classes all about like writing studies methodologies, writing pedagogy, digital rhetoric. So just look at those previous course listings and see if you're seeing patterns there to be able to see what the program's reputation is. Another thing to look at when deciding if this is going to be a good fit, a good match for the both of you all is to look at work-life balance. Again, this is something that grad students I think will be really transparent with you, professors maybe, to ask what they like to do outside of school. Does it seem like grad students have lives? Are they doing things besides reading and writing and studying all day? That was a big question that I asked during Perspective Student Weekend. I was like, so what do you guys like do for fun here? And they were able to tell me they go to trivia, they really like to drink, they hang out with each other's dogs, just spend a lot of time on the weekends together. Whereas other programs, I know they were like, honestly, my weekends are spent doing work, writing my dissertation and stuff like that. So if work-life balance is big to you, like it is to me, and I think it should be big to you, you should ask what people like to do. I touched on this one a little bit, but just to go into more detail, is there faculty that you want to work with? So this is a really obvious one, and there's a lot of mixed feelings about this because people say, don't go to a university or don't pick a program just because of one faculty member because they can leave and then you're sort of like stuck and you're out of luck. Um, so make sure that there's at least a couple faculty members who you'd be interested in working with. Another thing to look at is their diverse faculty. And I mean that in a bunch of different things. Is it racially diverse? Is it gender diversity? Is it sexuality diversity? Um, as well as like, do they study a bunch of different things? Because your research interests will change more than likely or be tweaked, be modified. So give yourself that diversity um, as needed. Also, I had literally two female professors who I had the option of choosing to work with on my committee and one of them is in like rhetoric and communication so she's not even in my area. So I had one woman who I could put on my committee as someone who studies like women and women's bodies. So that's something that I wish I would have looked into more. Will I be able to work with women? <laughs> will I be able to work with women who will understand what it's like to have a woman's body? Um, that's a challenge that I navigate quite a bit. But if you're interested in studying specific things like that, are there faculty who you feel comfortable working with who will understand the issues that you're talking about in the ways that you would need them to? And then also cohort size. So this is a really big deal to some people to be really close to their cohort. So you're probably wanting to look for a cohort of maybe two to three people rather than a cohort of like 10 people, which I had, which was a mega cohort when we came into the program. Um, if you're wanting to be really close knit with them, you probably want a smaller cohort size. And that's something that you can ask faculty or grad students and they would be transparent and tell you that. And then lastly, is it a city that you even want to live in? So when I was applying to programs, I was going to apply to two different schools in Arizona. And the more I was thinking about it, I was like, I don't want to live that far west. That feels way out there. I cannot imagine living way out there when my family is in Florida. So I ended up not even sending those applications. If you can't imagine yourself living in this city, it's not going to be a good fit for you. Because yeah, the program and the schooling and the university is really important, but it's also the city that you live in. If a big city is important to you, don't go to school in Indiana. <laughs> don't go to school in the Midwest. If you don't want to go to school in a big city, don't go to school in Miami. Don't go to school in New York. Um, that feels really obvious, but also like little things that I didn't think of, like going to Bloomington or going to IU at Bloomington means that I'm an hour away from an airport, which is a 
really great thing because if I would have gone to school in like Iowa or something like my brother did, the airport is like three to four hours away from him, which just makes traveling really, really hard, especially since I'm close to my family and I go home a lot. Just these are little things to consider. Would you want to live in that city? Is it a climate that you feel comfortable in? Is the environment something you feel comfortable in? If the political views of the city seem to align with your own political views, if you would feel safe there, these are all just as important to consider as all of these other things that I've talked about in terms of fit. Okay, and last but not least, the most important thing, will you get a job when you graduate? So people go to PhD programs for a lot of different reasons, hoping to get a lot of different jobs. I think I'm speaking mostly to people who want jobs in academia because a lot of people who go to school in English, specifically rec comp, stay in academia, and I personally am hoping to stay in academia. So this is something I wish that I would have looked into a little bit more. Will I get a job? when I come out of the end of this and how do I know I'll get a job. So a big one is to ask faculty or to poke around on the website and see if they have a listing of where previous grad students have ended up. And I know my undergrad university, University of Florida, has this listing and you can see previous grad students and their positions, if it was a lecturer, a tenure track professor, uh, writing center director, and what university they're at. Did they get an R1 job, an R2 job? Are they working at a small liberal arts college? Where are they at? These are really, really, really important things to look at. Does that university have a history of people placing into the types of jobs that you would want to place into? So personally, I don't want an R1 job. I don't want to work at a big university. So it's not a big deal to me if um, previous students have been placed into R1 schools or not, but it is a big deal that they have gotten a job. So that's something that I asked about, but I wish I would have dug into a little bit more to know what types of jobs people were getting. Another way that you know that you would get a job at the end of this is how much professional development is offered by the program, by the grad student union, if there is one, how much do they talk to you guys about that professional development life? How much do they talk to you about teaching statements, CVs, publishing, all of that kind of stuff? I know that here we do quite a few like informal roundtables where we can ask professors a bunch of these questions. And a lot of this mentorship happens one-on-one, -on -one, so picking your advisor is really important. But I wish that we had like more courses built into our like class loads and just like more required events to really like bolster this atmosphere of professional development to ensure that we were getting jobs at the end of this. And if you're wanting to stay in academia, publishing is pretty important. You're wanting to publish at least once, I would say, when you're in grad school. Um, my advisor encourages me to try and be published three times before I go on the job market. So another thing to look at is how often are grad students in that area of publishing. I can only speak to English. I know people in the sciences, people in psychology, people in whatever fields. Publishing looks totally different in those other fields. But you should look at how often these students are publishing. And if they're publishing um, as co-authors on pieces with their advisors or on pieces with other grad students, or if they're publishing more um, as like solo authors and what types of piece they're, pieces they're publishing. Is it mostly book reviews? Is it an edited collection? Is it longer research-based pieces? These are all really important things to consider because publishing is a huge sort of box to check when you're applying to jobs in the academic world. Those are sort of the three big things from money to fit to will you get a job at the end that I think you should consider when you're deciding which program to attend. So hopefully if you guys are watching this video, you're in the ideal situation where you've received quite a few acceptances and they're all fully funded and you just don't know where to go. And I hope that this video was helpful for you in narrowing down these decisions. So I mentioned in the beginning that I decided on gut feelings mostly. Gut feelings are really important. If you visit a school and it doesn't feel great, don't go there. Um, but it's also nice to have a bit more like a rational, logical approach when deciding which school to go to. So let me know in the comments if this was helpful. Let me know if you have any specific questions. I would love to chat with you. Send me a DM on Instagram, send me an email, leave a comment talking to people about grad school and making the process more transparent. Um, it's really the goal of my YouTube channel because I was so lost when I first applied and attended. So thank you guys so much for watching. Feel free to subscribe, check out my other videos, make a bunch of vlogs, and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!